The following is presented as an entertainment program emphasizing folklore. It is not intended as legal or medical advice in any way and should not be used to replace the advice of legal or medical professionals. New World Witchery is a Patreon-supported podcast. This episode is brought to you by Thousand Volt Press, publishers of the Voices of the Dead series, Verona Green, the Renegade Tea Cookbook, and our book, Conjuring the Commonplace. We offer our gratitude by generously filling your mailbox with all of the leftover ketchup, taco sauce, and relish packets we found in our junk drawer. Not the horseradish sauce, though. That's ours. If you'd like to become a patron and help support the show while also getting some great perks, please visit www.patreon.com slash newworldwitchery, where you can pledge a dollar a month or whatever you can to help us get postage for this large duct tape ball of sauces. Apparently, it's irregular shaped. And thanks to all of our listeners. Are you looking for magic? Maybe magic that lives right where you do? If so, join us aboard our broomsticks and ride with us from the Atlantic to the Pacific, from the Yukon to the Yucatan, and find magic that's right outside your front door or just off of Route 66. Whether you're in the Windy City or the Crescent City, the city that never sleeps, or the city of brotherly love, we've got enchantment for you. I'm Corey. And I'm Lane. And this is New World Witchery. We're taking it slow and easy tonight with spells that simmer instead of sizzle. We'll be discussing long-term magic and magical maintenance with Delilah. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. Let me redo it. No, it's good. We can do it. I have no fun with that. I'll leave the, the, that up to the Delilah part in there. So Okay. I mean, I, I'm, is it copyrighted? I don't know. Like, is that I mean, it's like, a parody. It'd be okay. It's like a silly little thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I just, I get paranoid about things. You know how No, it's good. That's good. So, hi. How are you, Lane? <laughs> <laughs> I'm all right. How are how are you, my friend? Yeah, uh. I got busy, busy life. I think on both of our ends, we've got a lot going on. But for sure, you are about to take uh, an international journey. No, it's not just like a fortune cookie that I, I found. That's literally a thing that you're about to do. So <laughs> yeah, in about two weeks, I leave for Hungary again. I'm really excited to go back, and my husband and daughter get to come this time, and. I'm, we got a really cool B and B. It's like right on Heroes Square, and mm-hmm. I'm just I'm so excited. I'm I'm ready to go back. That's gonna be I've so really fun. been studying Hungarian a lot since yeah. the beginning of the new year, and you know, not I don't feel like I don't feel as confident as I do in Spanish, but I still feel like if I were kind of dropped in the you know the middle of Budapest, I would be all right, which is a big change from the last time I was there. So I'm just. I'm so ready. I'm excited. That is really exciting. Yeah. And you're going to, I mean, and you've been doing lessons online where you like have a, a tutor and everything. So mm-hmm. that, super impressed, super impressed by that, frankly. Oh, thank that. you. Thank you. It, it's, it's important to me, you know, cause I just, I love my sister-in-law and my niece and um, obviously like my brother, but you know, he, he speaks English. He's good. Right. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I mean, and she does too. I mean, very, very good English, but it's just, I want to, there's just something about someone's native language that, you know, mm-hmm. just can, haha, can really speak to them. And yeah, I just, I enjoy it so much. We actually were talking about to kind of tie this back into magic. We were talking about magical languages and alphabets as a future episode idea. So yeah, for sure. Hopefully yeah. that'll be coming down the pike soon. Indeed. Yes. Around the mountain or any other folk expression that you'd care to use, but yeah. 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 So that's something that we're kind of tucking in our pocket for some future episodes, but mm-hmm. yeah. And it does, you know, you mentioned learning languages, like learning languages takes a long time, takes it a does. minute to do, which is appropriate. Because we're going to be talking about things that take a long time tonight. We're going to talk about spells that require, that are more than just kind of a one and done thing that require a lot of maintenance, that require planning and long-term execution. So we're going to talk about some, some different examples of that and kind of our takes on, you know, when those are necessary and maybe when you can just do the, the quick and dirty version. So. Right. And just the benefits of both, I guess. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah. So, well, good. So I guess we'll just kind of dive in. I'm kind of thinking of this, I'm sort of putting this all under the label of something I'm sort of thinking of as slow magic in the same way that there's a lot of things that are about, you know, slow fashion or slow cooking slash slow eating slash, you know, any of these things where it's sort of a, you slow down, you take your time, right? 
to do whatever it is, whatever the craft is, and you don't try to do it. It's not fast fashion, right? But it's, you know, knitting. Knitting is a good example of like slow fashion. It takes a minute to make something. So for sure. Yeah. So these are, this is, this is kind of the bigger picture. And I think that really is hard sometimes for people to, to sort of get a grip on because when we imagine magic, I think we're somewhat conditioned to imagine it as a very rapid process, you know, just kind of based on how it's described, you know, in sort of popular literature and stuff like that. Like light a candle and then the next day you'll see results or something like that. I mean, I think that's even slow for some people. Like, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of us are like, one's at the ready. <laughs> you know, like it's very like, <laughs> and you're expected to sort of like flish, flish and swick, swish and flick. <laughs> and you get, and you get a result, right? Like you get that kind of like instantaneous thing of where magic is sort of a thing that happens because you sort of know the right words and the right way to do things or the sort of the, the abracadabra boom, poof, it's done. And that's, I mean, even stage magic kind of capitalizes on that idea, right? It's an illusion that happens in the moment. Mm, yeah. But I mean, stage magic, if you really know what stage magic is, if you know how stage magic works, it's a much slower process that you're only seeing the sort of tip of the iceberg, which is the wonder part of it, right? The, right. And how good that the magician is really depends on how good they are at the, the sleight of hand, the yes. making you look away. Yeah. Misdirection. Um, misdirection. <laughs> uh, that's the first oh, Disney reference for the night. We got it. We got it in. I apologize. So can I make a confession? Yeah. <laughs> sleight of hand and like stage magic mm-hmm. has always freaked me out. And I don't know why. Like it gives oh, me the creeps. I I cannot explain it because I remember like we used to, or not we, but you know, like maybe my brothers and my dad would watch like Secrets of the Magician, that show. And then like, I don't know. I think it was like the sawing the woman in half. And I don't know. It just, it gave me the creeps. It always has. I mean, there's definitely a circusy quality to some of it. And circus stuff can creep me out too. Sure. Which I mean, it's designed to be this kind of highly exaggerated experience of what we normally see. And, and the whole point of, of illusions is that they, they are sort of mind bent. They're mind freaks, right? <laughs> They're designed to kind of mess with your perceptions of reality. There's the, Oh God, I wish I could remember his name. He's the internet magician who does all these really interesting things with where like he'll be doing something on his iPad. And then all of a sudden, like there's really like a spider crawl. Like it looks like there's a spider crawling on the, the screen, like in video format, but then all of a sudden it's actually real. Mm, um, yeah. He does like really good transitions. I think I've seen that yeah. either him or that, that style. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Zach King. That's his name. Zach King is the guy who does okay. that. And so he does those, those kind of really fascinating and that's the thing. It's a fascination, right? It's the thing that allows mm-hmm. us to sort of lose ourselves in that illusion. But it also can be really disorienting because like I think about there's an illusion that you can do where it's basically a couple of con convex mirrors aligned in a specific way or sorry, concave mirrors aligned in a specific way. And you can put something in one part of the mirror and then just do the tricks of the light. It looks like that thing is sort of holographically at the top of the mirror bowl. Mm-hmm. And so you You're reach like, for it. Is that like Pepper's ghost? Something like that. Right. Yeah. And you kind of reach and it's not there, right? You can put your hand through it Mm -hmm. and how some people that is a jarring experience because they're so sure it's there. Right. Right. Or it's like when you lift up a a gallon of milk or a gallon of water and it's, there's not as much in there as you thought there was. And it's just this like, whoosh, (laughs) you know? Yeah. And so stage magic, I think relies very heavily on that sort of like, we're going to disorient you. And that's going to cause this experience of wonder. And I love, I actually really like stage magic, but I like it because of the sort of technical approach that it has to, it's, it's almost, it's almost like when people can do really complex math, it's very impressive to me because it requires a very specific sort of way of thinking and way of approaching a problem. There's a, an excellent show I listen to called Ologies with someone named Ali Ward, who basically she interviews people who are specialists in different science, sciences and fields and things like that. Mm. And one of the ones she did, she did enigmatology, which is puzzles, a guy that just specializes in puzzles, but he also does magic, but he mixes these two things together and does these like puzzles that are kind of like magic puzzles. And I'm like, that, that is the coolest thing I've ever heard in my life. (laughs) 
which makes me an enormous nerd. But I, I like, I think I've listened to that episode like three or four times at this point, just because it's so, it's so engrossing to me. So, mm-hmm. but yeah, so stage magic is that it's dependent on that in the moment thing for the wonder to hit. So, and I think a lot of the way people perceive magic, magic is conditioned by that expectation. Yeah, I could see that. I don't know, though. I think that a lot of witches have more realistic expectations. Like they know Mm -hmm. it's not going to be like in the craft where she does the glamour and her hair turns blonde as she moves her hair, her hands over it, you know, Mm. like, I I mean, I'm not I'm not arguing, but I'm also I don't know. I I, we're free to disagree. We're allowed to do that. We're friends. (laughs) Are you sure? Are you sure we're allowed to disagree? (laughs) We're not the same person. Yeah, and that I mean, I would, no, I think in your point about like witches, people who are regular practitioners of magic, I think they do know the difference. Mm-hmm. I just think like as a general public, if you say magic, okay. it's a very flash in the pan kind of a thing. Yeah, I could definitely say that. Yeah. And I mean, that's that's also a big uh, thing that I used to get a lot of. I mean, I don't really uh, have the opportunity, I guess, for people to harass me like that. But, mm-hmm. you know, it, like walking around with a book in my hands and, you know, someone saying like, oh, well, you know, do a spell right now or, uh, oh, you're not going to turn me into a frog or like so stupid, stupid stuff. Like, it's not funny, but, right. you know, that that's just what you what you get. <laughs> sure. And what would be really interesting would be, you know, like there are the there are movies that really play on this idea that somebody could do a spell on you in a moment and you wouldn't really, like it would, things might seem weird and creepy for a second, but you wouldn't notice it. But over time, things would start unfolding. So I'm thinking, mm-hmm. if you've ever seen drag me to hell, that basically happens. Like a, a woman takes a button from another woman's coat, says some stuff over it and then gives her the button back. And so from that point on, she's marked by this, right. this curse. And it sort of slowly unfolds. And I mean, there's, problems in that portrayal to some extent too but like that's the sort of thing where magic is like this very slow unfolding process and i think that, it reminds me of thinner uh, too which yeah. again mm-hmm. like very problematic with how that happens i'm pretty sure i haven't because mm-hmm. i haven't read it in a very long time but yeah like he you know slowly over the course of however long just gets thinner and thinner and can't g- gain any weight and oh that's really horrifying to think about but yeah that that inevitability of the buildup and the, mm-hmm. but the slowness of it is definitely part of the, the horror. Yeah. Yeah. That you, like, how do you escape it? Right. And so many, so many of the sort of most horrific spells do depend on this kind of like slow, the sort of slow setting in of the magical effect. Right. And even one of our favorite movies, skeleton key, right? Mm. Like that, the only way that the final kind of spell works is because all of the other stuff that has been leading up to it has been conditioning the person to accept the spell's results. That's right. So, I mean, not not that we're trying to take like all of our cues from pop culture, but but if we're thinking about like the 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 ones that get it right, well, the craft gets a few things close, but a lot of it is still that sort of flashy stuff. You know, Harry Potter is the flashy stuff. But these ones that are sort of like the skeleton key or thinner, where it's very slow unfolding, those are probably closer to what we actually experience in, in magical practice, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that for sure. See, we did agree. Aw, <laughs> we got there. <laughs> okay, so should we, I mean, I, I have a whole list of different types of spells. Is there anything else that you wanted to kind of add before we get into that about... You know, what what does slow magic mean to you? Well, it it just I guess the the reason that it works so well for me anyway, you know, the types of spells that I've done where like, you know, you light a candle every night for a week or, Mm -hmm. you know, you keep it burning or you move it closer each Mm -hmm. night, you know, things of that nature. It just it really shows the universe or spirit or whatever you happen to be kind of hoping to prove it to, I guess that you're dedicated, like that you're really Mm -hmm. in this, you're putting so much of yourself into it by keeping your mental focus on it. And just remembering to, to do it every night is a big deal, at least for me. I mean, I don't want to sound like, you know, an annoying person who's like, oh, I'm getting so old. But, you know, my memory is definitely not what it was. And so, like, 
to be able to remember something like that takes a little bit of extra effort for me now. And when it comes to spell work, that can be a good thing, you know, to, to have that little bit of extra mental effort because mm. that is sometimes, well, at least in my opinion, the push that the like that magic needs, you know, like that's, that's part of it to me. So anyway, that's kind of just how I feel about it in general. Does that ring true for you? Yeah. I mean, I can see that. I think, I think I kind of take it, it's less about sort of proving it to the universe, but although I don't dis- debate or dispute that, because I think it, it really comes down to kind of how you're viewing magic as, you know, what's kind of fueling the magic in some ways. Is it, is it sort of a, the, the spirits on the other side or the, 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 the energies you're working with and things like that. And for me, uh, you know, the metaphor I often kind of work with with magic is it's a language. It's a, it's a sort of way of speaking to the, the universe, right? And so it's kind of like if you do something long enough, you're repeating it over and over and over again. And the more you repeat something, the more firmly it sort of takes hold like in your, in your mind. Right. So this is why, you know, we have choruses in a song, right. And we have these repetitions so that, cause that's the hook. That's what's going to catch you. Right. Or when you're learning a new language as, as you are, right. There's certain phrases that are going to start to stick because you have been repeating them day after day, after day, after day. And that right. helps them to hold on. So I feel like that's, that's kind of how I think about slow magic is it's the, it's the, it's that, push for this thing to to stick and and the stickier it gets the more likely it is to come true the more likely it is to sort of work its way out into the into the world um yeah sort of the full focus of your your energy or your power yeah and i definitely want to kind of like back it up a little bit and and say that i'm not trying to say that only the slow magic is like Mm. Or is slow magic is better because like you're more into it or something. That's Mm. not what I'm trying to, because sometimes the best is just like kind of the crock putt of it all. Just set it and forget it, you know, and like Mm -hmm. (laughs) just, just walk away from it and let it do its thing. And, and that's totally okay too. I'm just saying there are different, you know, different ways you're feeling sometimes. And you're like, you know, this could really benefit from a long-term thing and, or I could benefit from working the long-term magic maybe. So I, I don't know. I, I guess I, I just want to say one is not better than the other. And sorry if I made it sound like that, but oh, I didn't think I, that at all. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good, good, good. I just don't no. want to, I want to, I want to be clear. Yeah. And, and yeah, and just same on my end, you know, like for, for me, yes, I love this idea of the repetition and everything. And sometimes a catchy song is, is wonderful, but it's just as effective sometimes to shout fire really loudly when you have an emergency. Mm. And I think right. short-term magic, quick magic is that it's just a, it's, it's doing different things for different reasons. And you you can wind up with kind of different results because of that. So. Right. But I do think that magic is, does tend to uh, the, the, um, the slow burn, I guess more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For a lot of like what we think of as kind of like quote quote, unquote real magic, right. A lot of it does feel like it has to take a longer amount of time. So, so yeah, we can, we can definitely kind of explore some of those, those versions of that too. You had mentioned multi night candle burnings. I think maybe we can start there because that's probably something that's the familiar to, to most people is this idea of you burn a candle and even just the act of burning a candle is going to take time because most candles, unless they're birthday candles, are going to take a couple of hours at least to, to mm-hmm. burn out. And, and you can even have these practices, things like novenas where you have, you know, seven or nine night candle spells where you're very intentionally making the candle take multiple nights to, to burn in order to make that result happen over that amount of time. Mm-hmm. So, so that's, those are kind of the first thing I think of, you know, Me too. yeah. So, so like, do you want to talk a little bit about like, what have been your experiences with, you know, these long-term candle spells? Do you, do you do, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry, losing my voice or hitting puberty. Speaking of things that take a long time. Yeah. So when you're burning your candle, like for a candle spell, like, is there a specific kind of like slow burn candle spell you default to? I usually make up my own. I just, I've always been attracted to candle magic and I've always just kind of, like I said, done my own thing with it, like what felt right. And Mm -hmm. that's tended to work the best for me. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I've done candle spells where like you would light particular ones in a particular order. And then I would do that, like I said, over, I think it was five nights because there were five kind of points in total as I Mm -hmm. laid them out in a a star. Mm -hmm. 
so yeah, that, and I often do them for kind of prosperity or money or, you know, just I have in the past. It's not like I think mm, prosperity, that's a candle spell. It's just, I'm usually like, oh, okay, I'm in the mood for, you know, this type of spell when I need pr- prosperity or money at that particular time. It's just, I guess, coincidence, Mm -hmm. but, but they do, it does tend to work for me, you know, like using green candles and, you know, putting some coins in the middle of, of it, or like around the candle, if you're only using one and kind of letting the wax drip onto uh, the money and run over it. And yeah, that's, that's always been successful for me. And there's not much more to add, but besides like what you were saying of, you know, moving them closer or doing them over a certain number of nights, but I guess I like the little char- chime candles, I think they're called. They mm-hmm. usually last maybe an hour or three, I, I want to say, depending on the size you get. So, yeah, I just I, I use the smallest ones I can because, you know, I'm I'm busy. But mm-hmm. <laughs> but I do like to go back and relight them, you know, as I've said multiple times now o- over multiple nights. <laughs> sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Which, I mean, this is something that you're not alone in, right? This is a tradition that appears in numerous cultures, like having magical lamps is one thing. You can like burn a lamp, an oil lamp for several nights. I mean, Hanukkah. Not that, I was about to say. Yeah, I don't want to quite equate this and say like, oh, it's a magical lamp. But like the whole point of it is that it burned longer than it should have with the oil that was available. So exactly. this idea of like a multi-night burning spell with like oil that has been sort of magically charged or magically treated that's that kind of magic too. So, so yeah, so those kind of candle spells are there. And then you also have ones that like you do specific things to the candles. Like there's one where you put pins at a certain, like sort of like at little intervals and you let it burn down to each pin as the, as the spell goes. And then you collect all those pins at the end and make a little packet out of them. I think that's an Azorna Hurston essay where she talks about that. And I th- it might be a breakup spell, mm. <laughs> but yeah, the idea is that you're kind of, you're sort of setting your timing on the candle by, by setting the pins, but the, the pins also serve a magical purpose too, obviously. So, yeah, I feel like I've seen like old versions of like alarm clocks where it was mm-hmm. kind of something similar where like a, a pin would be in a candle and it would, you know, be set to burn for a certain amount of hours. And then when it fell, it would kind of clang onto the candle holder. I don't, I don't know if that, those are actually accurate, but I've definitely seen pictures of them. And so like, it would have been an actual timekeeping type device. Yeah. Yeah. They have, and there is one that's, there's a candle that you can put in like a spiral holder that will burn down and it'll kind of self extinguish at a certain point, but that would also, you could set it up so that it could pull a bell at the same time as it's self extinguished. I wouldn't necessarily recommend sleeping while you have a candle burning. No, I no, wouldn't either. Not a great idea, but you know. I've mentioned this like maybe one time before, but I often, you know, like because some spells will call for like leaving a candle burning, and I just don't have either the time or like the, you know, like I need to go to bed, right? And I, mm-hmm. like you said, I don't want to leave it burning. So I do this thing where I will extinguish it, but just kind of say or you know, like either in my head or aloud, like, you know, I'm, I'm extinguishing this in this kind of, in this world, this plane, but not in the astral or the, the other, however you want to phrase it, whatever mm-hmm. works for you. But, you know, like it's in some, in some way it's still burning. And, you know, for some people, for some witches that may not work, that may be a, like a cop out or something, but that's, mm-hmm. that does work for me. So just Black. right. No, it is, it is what it is. Yeah. So, yeah. and I mean, if it, were, it has worked for you, then it's working. So, right. <laughs> as, we, as we often say. Yeah. I mean, you have, and you have other ones that are like the knob spells and like the, the knobs of the candles will kind of burn out as they go and, and stuff like that mm-hmm. too. So, yeah. So yeah, I get that. I, I like when I'm thinking about candle spells, like the I mean, my Catholic upbringing, I think ringing through, but I really the, like the glass in case novenas. Mm-hmm. Those are the ones I really enjoy doing work with because you can load them and charge them and things like that. And one of my favorite things I found to do is they sell a lot of glass encased ones that where they just have plain glass and then I, and then whatever color of candle you want inside of them. And I use them for like saint, you know, saint or, or ancestor veneration purposes too sometimes. But the ones that just have the plain glass, like what I love to do is take a sharpie and you can draw on the outside of the glass and like make symbols. Or like do, you know, put specific spells and things like that on the outside of the glass and let it burn down. And then you're kind of watching it as it goes down and the flame passes through each part of the sigil that you're doing. And it's like it's slowly charging the work as it burns down. And you can also read like the flames and the the smoke as they're burning each night. And I, I just really enjoy that aspect of it. So mm-hmm. that's, that's one of the ways I really enjoy. Yeah. 
Yeah, I've, I've noticed that with you is that you, you use a lot of Novena type candles. Yeah. I, I noticed some people too use them with like, uh, I don't know how to phrase this, like new, new saints, like pop culture type saints. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we would call them folk saints. But, okay. But they okay. can also be pop culture saints, but like Dolly, right? Or yeah. Like Dolly. Mm-hmm. Or yeah. Or Stevie Nicks or, you know, just a lot of like, I see a lot of strong women, but you know, any type of person that, you know, you wanted to put on there, I'm mm-hmm. sure you could, but it's just an idea. And I, I don't know. I like kind of taking positive qualities from, you know, from like well-known figures like that, even if they're fictional, you, you know, like that it's not like for me personally, but I don't know. I just, I like the idea of it. I like the idea of people doing it. For sure. Yeah. Judica Elish has in surprisingly not the 5,000 spells book, but she has another, she has several encyclopedias. And one of them is mystic saints and sages. And she talks about these folk saints and like Elvis is a really big one that she mentions. And people have been doing Elvis for a long time. I had a roommate when I was in college who kept basically novenas of Selena in her bedroom because she's a really big Selena fan. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, like they make them for a lot of people. And just because they're a folk saint doesn't mean that like they don't have some clout. <laughs> they right. They seem to. So yeah. So, yeah. I love that. Definitely. Um, okay. Anything else we want to say on candles? Cause we got, we got lots of slow magic to get through and we're, we're <laughs> not going to be able to take our time as much as we would like. Well then let's slowly <laughs> move through this like a yes. herd of turtles. <laughs> <laughs> hey, good transition is the next thing on the list. Is a turtle turtle spell shell or turtle shell spell? <laughs> turtle spell shell spell shell shell spell. Anyway, so this is something um, that I was actually taught by uh, somebody when I was at a a festival, like a magic festival in Kentucky, and I got this turtle shell. It was uh, she had harvested the turtle shell from like it was, it was it, at least as far as I know, it was an ethically sourced turtle shell from a turtle that had died, and so one of the things that she showed me was that you know most turtle shells, if you look at the way the scoots, the different plates on the turtle shell are, there's 13 of them, which corresponds oh. to moons. And so she taught me, like, if you load something into the shell and put something in the shell that you want to manifest within a year, you can do a year long spell. And every month on the full moon, you touch a new scoot, a new little panel, and you repeat kind of the, the spell that you did originally to charge the spell up. And then over the course of the year, it will begin to manifest itself in your life. So that was, I, I always thought that was really, really neat. And one of the things that I really love about like when magic has these interesting overlaps in the world, which is like, why, why would turtles have a 13 plate shell that so perfectly aligns with them? And it's like, there's no real reason for it, but what a great thing for human beings to have kind of noticed and then sort of turn that into magic as well. So. Absolutely. Yeah. I love when stuff like that happens. Mm -hmm. It's like finding, you know, the Fibonacci sequence in Mm -hmm. nature and things like that. It's like, hmm. What's going on there? I love love that. Okay. All right. I've never heard of that spell before. I really like that idea. Yeah. It was, it's one that was very, very new to me and I love it. It's one, and I I still have a turtle shell that I use um, if I need long-term magical things. So like I used it during my PhD to help kind of get through specific things. Like my, my dissertation, like was very much powered by that. And then my first book was also powered by that one too. So yeah, I probably need to drag it out so they can get to work on another book. (laughs) (laughs) It's going to be turtle shells all over my, all over my, my townhouse. (laughs) All these different turtles all the way down, right? Turtles all the way down. Right. Oh goodness. Okay. One that I think we both have a little bit of experience with is the concept of sweetening and souring jars. Mm -hmm. And so these are jars that you would, I guess with the souring, it would be like vinegar, maybe, I don't know. What are some other things that that you've put in souring jars? I mean, you can do stuff like urine or ammonia. I have not done those specifically for souring jars. I I, I know, I know Dr. P's (laughs) on stuff, right? (laughs) That's I what, wasn't going to say it. That's what Kathleen Borealis calls me. Yes. <laughs> Dr. P's on stuff. But, but yeah, so the, the vinegar is the one that I default to because, because vinegar is so good at souring. And sometimes I use like pickle juice instead, but like same, same concept, right? Mm-hmm. But like vinegar with salt in it. And then you can load vinegar up and it kind of absorbs the qualities of those things. So like hot peppers are really, really good in there. And so that's the kind of thing. If I'm going to do a souring jar, I want something like that. So. So is the pepper like a, like a hot 
flooding type of thing? Like a get out of here, like leave you alone? Or is it just to kind of aggravate? It's an aggravate. It's an agitation. It sort of makes everything even that much more uncomfortable, right? Okay. The, okay. It's not just having an itch, but a rash, you know, that kind mm-hmm. of a thing. Mm-hmm. And, and it sort of needles somebody and, and, and you know, to be fair, you know, in using it, it very rarely use, uh, I very, very rarely use any kind of souring jar. Mostly I'm using sweetening jars, so I'm doing that kind of work, but it's only because I'm, it, because I'm trying to prompt somebody to do something they should have done in the first place or something they were supposed to have already done and they, they didn't do it. So, <laughs> yeah. not you. Not you. I was about to <laughs> say, how many jars do you have? Let me go over to the lane shelf. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, no, you. let's put the podcast up. Let me get it. this one some more sugar. This is the podcast jar. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, hi, are we recording tonight? Shake, 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 shake. Shake, shake, shake. <laughs> no, it's not that. Not that at all. Oh, my goodness. So, yeah. No, I am a procrastinator, though, so maybe maybe we should pour some sugar no. on I was gonna, Well, yeah, I, we can def leopard this situation for you all you want, but I'm not putting you in a, in a vinegar jar given the year, year and a half, three years that you've had. <laughs> like, I swear. Nope. I don't know if we actually like said this in an episode. Like, I know you, you put it out in like the newsletter or whatever mm-hmm. for people, but if you're not subscribed to that, that's totally fine. So like we finally figured out what's been going on. We have black mold in our house. Our shower wasn't installed properly in our home that we had built like seven years ago so you know we're the only ones who lived in it it's just been a nightmare and but hey i'm choosing to look on the bright side that we are finally getting better yep we are no longer showering in that shower Mm -hmm. (laughs) and like you know it immediately our sinuses got better the coughing got better so anyway sorry to distract but i just no, I mean, it definitely, that's that one of those things that you feel like, oh, that feels like a vinegar jar was, was hiding out somewhere. I swear it was not me. I had nothing to do with that. So, well, it, it was interesting that we discovered it right after you and I did the cleansing spell. Mm-hmm. And it was just like, we've got to do something. Please, like, I'm, I feel like I'm dying here. And it, it, <laughs> I could have been, you know, like if it had gone on long enough and with us not seeing it, I don't know. But yeah, it, it just, some, some weird series of, of things happening. Yep. Well, I'm, but, I'm glad that the, I'm glad that the cleansing work worked. So me too. <laughs> that kind of pushed us in that direction me or pushed you too. all in that direction. So yep. sweetening side of things though. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've done a couple of these favorite ones to do are honey, but I'm also cautious about doing honey jars because honey is very expensive. So I've also been known to do this in just like sugar. So now you know, have you done why any? are these? I feel like I have, but I cannot remember on whom or why, or I think it might've been a boss, like just a sweetening spell just Mm -hmm. to kind of, you know, because we got along. Okay. But she definitely didn't like me and I didn't like her. So (laughs) it it was kind of just to improve our working relationship. Nothing, you know, nothing crazy. Mm, That makes sense. Yeah. If I'm remembering correctly anyway. Yeah. And yeah, and for me, it was an employment. Like employment is one of the ones I probably have used it on the most. Where it's and it's really I've used it both to sort of make sure that like I get job interviews, or I get you know second round of interviews, or you get a good offer, or you know maybe keep myself in somebody's mind as a top candidate. And you know, and also you know sometimes I'll even do it if I'm like thinking about getting a raise. And so a lot of my my jars they'll wind up being like sugar. And then tobacco winds up in there because tobacco is in, in folklore, at least it's kind of like offering that you can make basically sort of like you're, you know, it's like when you sit on the back porch smoking cigars with somebody, right? It creates this sort of sense of amiability, right? Yeah. It's like a a friendship thing to me or like a, Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it very much reminds me of my dad and, Mm -hmm. you know, he was a big smoker and um, like I have a little, you know, a cigarette sitting on his little kind of ancestral altar that I've got going for him. Mm-hmm. right now um and yeah it just it it's like hey you know you, you want a cigarette like you just want to sit and smoke and shoot the shit right mm-hmm. that's kind of like how i i feel when i when i use tobacco as an offering it's it's like you know like i'm i'm your friend i'm i'm just coming to kind of i'm so sorry to, to use this phrase but just like vibe with you yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> and you know i hope we can do that <laughs> yeah for sure yeah yeah, and I mean cinnamon. I'll throw in there as well because cinnamon has a very like friendly vibe to it mm. as well. It's a very excuse me. It's, it's warming, but it's also sweet. Can, so yeah, I can 
homey, but it can also be, you know, like prosperity and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of where, and that is something that, you know, you leave somebody in there until you no longer need their interaction. And and it doesn't hurt them. Like that's one of the nice things about sweetening jars is it just kind of keeps them positively aligned with you, positively connected to you. Um, as opposed to, you know, vinegar jars, like both, both sugar and vinegar jars are designed to to be used until the person has sort of met the criteria you had for them and then take them out. Sugar jars, you could continue to leave them in if you really wanted to, because it's not going to hurt them. It's not going to do any harm to them. It just kind of continues to keep them sweet on you. So, right. It's no harm there. All right. What about ice or freezer spells? I've definitely done these. Mm -hmm. Either freezing someone like just someone's name in a block of ice or putting them in a like sewing them up in a cow tongue is Mm. quite common and just i think you stuff i can't remember some sort of herb in as well you can do like peppers and stuff like that too Mm. i can't remember but yeah or alum you can put alum in there and it'll make it sort of shrink up shrivel up Mm. okay yeah i've not heard that one Mm. so yeah i've done that to to stop gossip in like a work situation and uh, of someone who was kind of you know, like quick to anger mm. in, in my life and just needed cooling off basically. And I, I you know, just wanted a, a, a slow kind of fading out of my life, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and freeze them out, but not in a, a horrible way. You know, like I, I didn't mean any harm. It's just, it was like, okay, I'm, it's time to move on, I guess. Yeah, it kind of it kind of puts you out of mind of them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, yeah. It felt safer. Like I, I know that may sound wild to some people, but it just I, I felt safer when <laughs> when that person was in the freezer. I was just like, okay, I I feel like I can breathe a little bit better. Like they're not gonna fly off the handle about this certain thing. Right. Kind of cools their head. As yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's like a that, really good in my experience, that has been the case. What about you? Yeah, I mean, I haven't really used a ton of freezer spells. You know, mostly it's it's used to to like you said, sort of stop gossip or stop stop a bad situation. I know I've thrown somebody into a freezer before when I thought there was going to be I thought there was going to be more of a conflict than there actually was. And maybe the freezer spell is part of why that happened. But it was a situation where at work there had been some rising tensions, and so I put this person in the freezer basically to get them to kind of chill out, mm-hmm. <laughs> so to speak. And, you know, and it did like everything kind of calmed down over the next couple of weeks, but it wasn't there to hurt them in that scenario. It was, it was there to just kind of keep them, keep them cool. But you can do versions of it where you're, you're designing it to sort of cool everything in their life. But, but that's a little more unusual. So really the, the ice or freezer spells are designed to give everybody a cool head in that moment. So yeah, yeah. yes. And, and it's not really something that you keep up, but you do keep it frozen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's once um, it's in there, it kind of is done, but it, it's a it's a long term spell because it stays until you're done with it. So right, yeah, it's it's not something that I I think you should just forget about, and you know you find <laughs> back in the freezer a few years later, like oh crap, you know it's, it should not be. Stick? What was this? Oh no, Harriet! <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. I love it. Okay. Yep. Okay. Next thing on the list is egregores and servitors. Yes. Um, what is what is this? Explain, please. So an egregore is a collective spirit entity, something that a group will sort of collectively put their energy into to represent that group or to work on behalf of that group and its benefits. A servitor is an individual spirit creature that you create or summon into being. Kind of depends on the system that you're working from, and it goes out and does specific jobs for you. And then when it's done, it has a contracted life. And when it's done with its job, it is supposed to be freed and go do it. You set it free. Basically, you finish it up. And some for some people, that setting it free is destroying it. And for some people, setting it free is just kind of letting it loose, letting it go be whatever it needs to be. Some people say you should not do that because then it will basically look for something to inhabit. And, you know, whatever is convenient, like the creepy doll in your corner will, will suddenly start to become a lot more active, you know? So you have to be a little cautious. All the dolls that. in my corner just were like, we're not creepy. <laughs> we're perfectly sane and nice. Please <laughs> give us chainsaws. 
for crafting purposes. Mm -hmm. Uh Yeah. So I have done, so I've done aggregores with several different groups, one of which was actually our, on our Discord server. We had right. a group of folks who got together. We came up with this really wonderful aggregore who I still have the little representation I made of, of him. And I loved him so much. I just love him so much. He's so cute. But that became sort of the, the manifestation of our group or the not manifestation, the sort of collective representation of our group that sort of was meeting in this server to talk about it and then sort of is there to watch over and protect all of us. And what's really interesting is like so many of the people who were there for part of that creation have maintained contact through discord and through our, through our, our discord, through our kind of group. And I mean, that's, you know, you can look at that and say like, well, because they met through us, of course, they're going to be more active together there, but some of them are really good friends now. So I, I like to think that that collective spirit sort of works to, to keep us all bound together in, in really positive ways. So. Yeah, I, like that. I, I would agree with that. Uh, spell or no spell. <laughs> yeah, but it's designed to be a very long term. Like it's a, it's essentially a living entity that will live until the group agrees to to dis, dismember it, <laughs> which sounds really horrifying. But yeah, disband maybe. Dis, yeah, it agrees to sort of you know what be a release. We'll say release it. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. But then servitors, and I I did this, I took a, a course on servitors from Madame Vendredi, who taught some online courses on, on gin magic and things like that too. But she also taught, taught about servitors. And I learned to design and kind of work with servitors there. And I'd also read, read about it in some other, and there you're, you know, it is, it's, it's, it can be very long term. Peter Patton once talked about like a servitor he created, I think that was basically a, a squirrel who he sort of manifested this kind of like, squirrel spirit that would go and run and find things for him and help him with like research or help him with like finding opportunities for, for different things that he wanted to do. Oh, so, I, yeah. you know, it's so funny. He had some of the, I say this with love and respect, the wildest mm-hmm. ideas, mm-hmm. but the way he would describe them and talk about them, they made complete sense. Yeah. And I can, I can just hear him like, talking about you know like a squirrel finding a nut mm-hmm. and just like uncovering things for him and yeah. i can i can really see that working being like okay i need to find this particular like thing cited in a book or i need more citations for this like help me find it you know i can i can say that absolutely yeah and i mean that was perfect it would work really well for me so, like it would be a wonderful like research assistant kind of servitor yeah yeah. Yeah. And mine was largely there to help me support marketing efforts for my first book and, and do some work on that. And it, you know, it did what it was supposed to do. I don't know how well it did it, but it, you know, it feebly dragged us across the finish line on certain things. <laughs> so I appreciate its, its effort and its service. So. <laughs> but like spirit contracts in general, like this are very long term. They're designed to be, you know, you enter into a contract, you formulate a contract with a spirit Even crossroads rituals, right, are designed to be these things that you do. Yes, you can. There are versions where you just meet the person at the crossroads one night and get the 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 abilities. But most of the folklore around them, you're going out every Sunday for seven Sundays or every Sunday for nine Sundays or nine nights in a row. And each night you're going to meet a creature um, that's an all black creature. The first night it'll be like an all black cat. The next night it'll be an all black dog. Next night it'll be an all black bird. And you'll meet these things that like are sort of sort of checking to make sure that you're, you're showing up so that then the last night something, you know, will show up that, that is very different and profound, like the man in black kind of a thing. And will then offer you that spirit contract or, you know, teach you the skill that you're asking for and things like that. So those, those are, I think very much kind of a slow burn type of magic and they do require that sort of like repetition and showing up. And they're very much your whole point about like, Proving to the universe you're serious mm-hmm. there, that really makes sense to me. So, yeah, 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 me too. Yeah. But other thoughts on spirit contracts or, or working with spirits as kind of long term magic? No, I don't have much. I think you have a lot more experience with that than I do. So, I'm good leaving it there. <laughs> I've got a lot of, a lot of very weird friends. Is what I'm <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I don't know. I got and I don't have any friends, friends which huh? leads me to. Mm-hmm. Our next point, which is I just sit around and knit. <laughs> <laughs> That's your not true. Are your friends? I have lots of friends, and I actually don't knit that much anymore, which is shocking because I still have miles of yarn. Yes. But, 
I need to pick it back up. <laughs> yeah. So we, I wanted to talk about this because, you know, a lot of people in the knitting community, even who like have no belief or kind of knowledge of magic will talk about it. Like it's a thing that you put your emotions into, you know, they'll be like, don't mm-hmm. knit angry. And part of it is because when you're, you know, more relaxed, your tension is going to be more relaxed, Mm -hmm. which means, you know, like the, how you pull the yarn, how tightly that is. And over time, you know, that creates the gauge for your work. And the gauge obviously does the size because if you're knitting it at five stitches per inch and, you know, you have four inches, that's what, 20 stitches that you need? Sure. We'll go with that. Did, did, Did I just do that completely? I don't, I don't know. I wasn't mathing in my head. I apologize. Okay. I don't know. So yeah, I, that's another reason knitting is a lot of, not, not a lot of math and it's not exactly hard math, but there's some math involved. And sometimes I just don't want to math. So, but there's a lot of people who say, you know, like don't, especially with baby clothes, you know, don't put, don't knit angry. Don't put any bad thoughts into it. You know, like only knit when you're in a good mood or like putting these positive attributes into it and it, it's such an interesting way to think about about it you know that you're you're putting your your love for this child into or or yourself you know it doesn't have to be like a, a kid's garment I'm just thinking because that's what I've knit before you know and, and kind of done it with intention I've never really knit socks my like my own socks with intention but mm-hmm. you know the the sweater that I made for your first child for example, was, you know, done knit very intentionally. So. Did you have to knit it with so much sass? That's what I'm asking. (laughs) So much sass. No, I'm kidding. No, they're just a teenager now. So that's where it infused. Okay. (laughs) Yes. There you go. (laughs) I love that. Yeah. (laughs) So anyway, I I guess that that's my point. Yeah. It's just, it's, Mm -hmm. it can definitely be seen as long-term magic. You know, each stitch builds on itself and, thousands upon thousands of stitches just for a small garment you know mm-hmm. depending on your your gauge i guess and um yeah it knitting really cumulative. does feel like magic to me it yeah, yeah it, it is very is. It is very cumulative yeah and if any if anything you knit you knit with intelligence because my 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 children are very smart so I, I assume that you knit you were you were reading all of the best books while you were knitting <laughs> um but yeah, i actually is, don't think i was i'm pretty sure i was reading charlene harris and the Sookie Stackhouse novels, which don't get me wrong, they're fun, but they are not Shakespeare. No, but that might be, that might explain some of the slightly goth tendencies. So no, no, no I mean, and I love, I love all of it. Whatever you did, I appreciate it. Cause I love, I love those kids. Cause your but kids are awesome. They're awesome. But, but yeah, no, there is something about like, you do something for a long time. It's very repetitive. It is this cumulative effect, right? It's this slow build that once everything, once you've, you know, done your binding off and, and sort of woven everything in it's it's a project that started with a single strand and became something complete and so magic kind of is a very similar thing so i can totally see that overlap between those two yeah yeah i've always thought of knitting that way but no. okay well so let me ask you then so we we're talking we've been talking about a lot of kind of like slow moving spells and slow moving ways we do magic but there is another kind of t- sort of angle on this, and this maybe even ties into some of the spirits contracts I'm talking about that I mentioned a minute ago, but there's this whole phenomenon of like magical maintenance too, like where you're, you're doing stuff where you have to sort of maintain your magical space or magical, you know, tools that you've created, things like that. And that's a different kind of slow magic, I think. But but what do you think on that? Yeah, I think like, all maintenance is slow magic, but not all slow magic is maintenance. You know, it's mm-hmm. like it falls yeah. under the umbrella a little bit. Of, yeah, I get that. Yeah, because like what you're talking about with a lot of the maintenance is like, you know, feeding mojo bags and talismans and that type of thing. You know, whether that be like anointing with oil or, you know, doing new offerings of food or drink or whatever you happen to do that is kind of upkeep, but it's also something that you put effort into over time. It's cumulative, like we were just talking about. And mm-hmm. so I really, I, I do feel that it's, it's still long-term magic. It's just kind of keeping the magic going instead of, you know, building it up for this big <laughs> explosion. Right. You're not, you're not necessarily working towards a singular 
outcome or result, but rather you're maintaining it so that the result that you were hoping for will continually be present in yes. your life, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I get that for sure. And sometimes it's a relationship. Sometimes it's about a relationship. So like I have a lot of like spirits or ancestors or things like that, that I do regular prayer offerings or food offerings or things like, like I've got a Fortuna altar in my house um, where I keep a little statue of Fortuna. And like anytime I get, you know, a little bit of pocket change, I'll toss that into the bowl or a little bit of uh, what we call folding money here down South. Right. Um, <laughs> like if I had a dollar bill or something, I'll put that yeah. in there or even um, Chinese fortune cookie fortunes. I put those in there as a sort of like, it's a cumulative build up, and it's a long term magical maintenance thing. And every once in a while, I, you know, take stuff out and I clean it and all that. And, and it really is this kind of like long term, slow build magic where I'm just kind of hoping that eventually over time, like my good fortune and my ability to kind of roll with the punches when things are down or, you know, my finances will all kind of at least more or less be on the positive side. So, mm-hmm. yeah. I think a lot of people have those. Even if they don't really see it as like a, you know, like a, a magical thing of, of mm-hmm. some sort, I think a lot of people have kind of little change dishes and, you know, that they kind of treat in that same sort of way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I know yeah. a friend of mine did and growing up, she had like one of those, I think it's like a Chinese toad with the, the coin in its mouth. I have one of those as well. Like yeah. My Fortuna, so. yeah, she had one of those that she would put coins around and, yeah. you know, of course, like if we needed one, we could take one out, but we would also add some to it. And yeah, yep. that, was, exactly. that was fun to do. Yeah. So yeah, you can take something out, but you have to put something back in. Right. But it doesn't, and that's one of the nice things is that you can take out a little bit of cash if you've got some cash in there and replace it with a fortune cookie fortune. And it's, it's all about kind of the intent of what you're doing. So, and, it, mm-hmm. and, and you're taking, and when you take something out, you're actually carrying a bit of the, the good fortune that was built upon that relationship and sending it out into the world so that it can serve you, but also serve whoever it comes to next and things like that too. So, yeah. Oh, I really like that sort of the, the pay it forward type of thought. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of a ripple effect. Yeah. Which yeah. I like. So, yeah. and there's a lot of that kind of stuff where you do these kind of magical practices sort of ritualistically over time. Like I just think about like, you know, magical house cleaning and stuff like that. Most of us have times of the year we do that. And it's something we may do kind of all at once, but then we expect the effects to kind of mm-hmm. think that's, that's important. But kind of on the flip side of that, there's also the sense of like anything you're doing on as a regular practice as well. Do you consider that slow magic? So like a friend of mine and I, we oftentimes will kind of trade daily tarot polls. Like, is that slow magic to you or is that because you're only reading for that day? So is it slow magic or is it instantaneous magic or is it something between like, how do you, how do you interpret that? But I, I love that you do that. And I might depend on how you interpret tarot Mm -hmm. and like, is it, is tarot some like a tool that you use to learn more about your subconscious and maybe it, it draws things out of you that you weren't necessarily or that that you were subconsciously like needing to talk about, but maybe weren't aware of it consciously Mm -hmm. or is tarot kind of like guided by spirits or your ancestors and the cards that you get are not, uh, you know, sort of a interesting way to read your, your brain, but like, you know, it, it's actually a message. And I, mm-hmm. I tend to go with the former, not, not the latter. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I think of it as more, it, tarot is more about like my own mind and how I interpret things and what I should be looking out for. Um, not really the, the spirit guiding. Although I do think that sometimes like there can be a little push. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'm not completely opposed to that idea. It's just, that's what I tend to, that's how I intend to interpret or interpret tarot. And that, that gets even more complicated when it's for another person. Mm -hmm. So there's that to talk about as well, but yeah. How do you, how do you see it? Like, let me, let me just shut up for a minute. How do you see (laughs) it? No, no, no. I love it. No, I I asked for your opinion on that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And it, you're, you're right. But the sort of how do you interpret it? Cause I do oftentimes in uh, sort of, I have certain spirits that I consider kind of my, my regular familiar type spirits that I interact with and I like do my weekly little prayers and offerings and things with. But then like when I'm working with divination, I'll oftentimes kind of quickly, you know, invoke them to briefly help guide me in my work. Not necessarily to sort of be like, 
you know, they're picking the card for me, but they're kind of helping me to understand the card better, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So, so there is a, there is a little bit of both on that. So, because I'm a Gemini, both and, right? Um, <laughs> you do things, but it is interesting because it's, it's something where, and I really should be, I should be, should say my friend is much better about sending me tarot daily than I am about sending him tarot daily. So, mm-hmm. But, but when we do, when we do exchange these, these little readings, and it's not quite every day, but you know, a couple times a week, really more than anything. And it's really wonderful because it's that kind of, moment of getting to learn a little bit more about the card, but also how somebody else reads and interprets cards. And then also kind of getting a sense of like, is there a story coming together over time of these cards? Like, is it following any kind of particular arc or trajectory as well? So I really do think there is a little bit of that kind of neat, slow build, even though the readings themselves are oftentimes very limited in terms of what they're telling you about that particular day. So. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that's been the case with with us, because mm-hmm. especially because we do monthly card pulls and, you mm-hmm. know, that's only one a month. But yeah. some of the ones that we were, or I don't want to speak for you, the, the ones that I was getting for you last year were... <laughs> they were very on point. You just didn't know how on point they were until it, well, we had a conversation. And I, <laughs> and I think I kind of did, but I didn't want to push it. And I, you know, it, it yeah. kept telling me what I thought it was telling me. But and then I was like, well, maybe not. Maybe but not. Maybe for Corey, it's actually this <laughs> more esoteric possibility. I'm like, no, no, you had it right. But we'll have to talk about that. <laughs> so. Right. Right. So that that has been interesting. I've like, oh, well, this card keeps popping up for you. Or I see this one in reading frequent readings for myself, you know, or there's a particular card that I happen to really kind of identify with and you know like a lot and that's the ace of cups Mm. so yeah i i definitely feel like it can be a a long-term magic sort of thing it's just kind of depending on how you you treat it or you know how you learn from it i guess yeah no i I definitely agree with agree with that and yeah yeah i mean it, it it can go a lot of different ways. Like if you, if you're winding up doing readings and you're like, this is the seventh time I've drawn the tower today. Like you probably are noticing a subconscious message at some point in there, right? <laughs> you, or that or you got the oops, all towers deck. You don't want one or the other. Yeah. But yeah, there is something about that sort of like, I don't know. There's a growth that happens in our relationship with the terror, but then I think also in our relationship with each other as we share this stuff too. So we get mm-hmm. to kind of like, like I think now you are probably much more likely to trust your instincts when you're reading for me and be like, so the card's saying this, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. So is something going on? Like you can kind right. of come forward with that, right. uh, which I really appreciate. So, right. <laughs> but yeah. Well, good. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's true for a lot of other daily practices too. Like if you do maintain an ancestor altar, I think that's, you know, part of that slow magic, you're building a relationship every time. If you're burning candles, if you're feeding your mojos or your lodestones, all of that is that slow relational magic, which is sometimes the, you know, very richest magic. I'm not saying that it's better than others, but it has this sort of richness that you might not get in other forms. So, yeah. And there's some magic that just has to, it takes time to manifest and build like some sort of like, you know, I don't want to get too, too many references to Harry Potter into this, but there's that whole thing where like, you know, there'll be no wand waving or blah, blah, blah in this class. And he says, but I can teach you to brew for brew fame, bottle fortune and put a stopper in death. Right. Mm -hmm. Like potion making that, you know, is a good representation of the kind of slow magic that exists out there that we do these things that they distill, they percolate, they ferment magically speaking. Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes it takes a long time to get those, but when they do pay off, it's pretty remarkable. And I kind of love that. Yeah, me too. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, let's take a quick break. We'll come back. We'll have a couple of quick listener emails. All right. We are back. Hi. We are back. So we've got two listener emails. I think I'll field the first one and then... Would you feel comfortable fielding the second one? Sure. For reading it? Okay. Yeah. So this one was really, it was really sweet. Both of these were really sweet and they both came in pretty recently. First one is, he says, hey guys, it's Mr. Smith. And he put that in quotation marks. I am a 60 something man of color in Chicago land. Chicago land. I've got family up there. So hello. Uh, enjoyed this episode very much. This was talking about our magic numbers episode, by the way. Mm, okay. Enjoyed this episode very much. 
For me, the Fibonacci sequence, Fibonacci sequence, Fibonacci sequence, and how it yields the golden ratio and golden square is significant. As an art teacher, it is a concept that we want to bring to students. Proportion, aesthetics, nature. Art is magic, don't you know? Answer back if you have a mind to. Blessed be. Mr. Smith, thank you. I love that. And yes, Fibonacci sequence, golden ratio, this... This kind of really interesting thing that artists have noticed, but also mathematicians have noticed about, you know, you look at a Renaissance painting and the way that it is arranged, it's kind of very similar to the way a Nautilus shell gets arranged, right? right? With these kind right. of like very specific structures and divisions within the, the composition. Magic. Do you think it's magic? I am inclined to. Yeah. Like it. This is probably really, really dumb, but it makes me think of Jurassic Park with like mm. Ian Malcolm and numbers and like chaos. And then, of course, that makes me think chaos magic. So like, I have no idea if there's any relation at all, but that's just where my weird brain went just then. Uh, but I do think that there's something to like the fact that we find these numbers, you know, quite often in nature and that they do have a pattern to them. And yeah, it's just it's very interesting to me. I don't know. Like. Fractals when they naturally occur. I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. Yeah, no, that's that's a really good that's a really good example of fractals for sure. And for me, like the Fibonacci sequence is interesting because it is a cumulative thing. It's like one, one, yeah. two, three, five, and you're adding each previous number to the number. It's like exponentials as well when they sort of cumu- they sort of accumulate in ways that you weren't in, immediately expecting, but they are following a pattern. And math is really interesting because math. You know, I mentioned earlier the way of you magic or yeah, the way of you magic is oftentimes is a sort of language. Math is also a kind of language, but it's a language that transcends words. Mm-hmm. Um, and, it, you know, the math that you do in one culture is going to be the math that you do in another culture, at least at some fundamental level. They're going to share a lot of the same elements. Right. Mm hmm. And so I do think math is a way of kind of, and there've been a lot of ceremonial magicians and chaos magicians who have really exploited that idea in a positive way. I don't mean exploited in like a negative way, but it really made use of that idea to be able to say like, oh, we can find really interesting patterns and then use those patterns as a sort of way to sort of hack, you know, the universe or hack magic, even tarot, right? Like Rachel Pollock's 78 Degrees of Wisdom. We talk about that a lot. She talks about these kind of sequences that build in tarot and how you have, you know, groups of threes mm-hmm. and groups of fours and how they're all kind of telling stories in little bundles, but then those stories also accumulate. So yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That kind of like interesting mathematical thing that also crosses over into art, which has its own language. I think there's there's magic to be to be drawn from that for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just in art, you have the rule of three, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. With with a composition and how that usually is very pleasing. And I mean, there's I mean, it's a small number. There's a number right there. (laughs) Yeah. It's like why threes? Why do we like the odd number? Why do we like it to be off center a little bit in certain instances and centered in others? It's just weird <laughs> yeah, and not just us like us uh, for sure but also that there seem to be certain mathematical things that other animals get drawn to too so i just think that's it's all fat it's all fascinating so yes yeah, yeah. agreed all right uh, you want to read this next one <laughs> i will try okay <laughs> okay <clears throat> hello cory and lane I love your show so much and heard every episode. Oh, thank you. It's really kind. Sometimes I hear someone repeat when I don't see new ones. I've listened to other witchy podcasts and y'all is top dog for me. (laughs) The quality, the episode themes, your compatibility, the way I'll lead with your voices. You both are incredible podcasters. Oh, that's very kind. Question. Do you have any references, spells, or rituals you can recommend for February 29th? Leap day. Thank you to both of you. And that is from Antonetta. Yes. Thank you, Antonetta. First of all, very sweet. Very yeah. sweet. And Antonetta is, I believe she's one of our Patreon supporters as well. And this is such a great question. And, it really is. And I'm glad that she sent this in because it's very timely. We're in February where we have a leap, leap day slash leap year going on this year. And you had come up with one really interesting thing before the episode. Do you want to share that? I don't know. I mean, yeah, interesting. I don't know if it's good or not, but I, I was just... You know, I hadn't really known of any leap day traditions or magical type of things. And I know that we had tried to come up with some for when the eclipse, the total eclipse happened a few years back. So I was just trying to kind of brainstorm what I might do if I, you know, had no <laughs> like magical books around me. It's just, like, just my knowledge. Like, what would I do? Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of like weird borrowing time with leap day mm-hmm. and 
you know, you're taking like minutes from certain days that should be there and you're holding them until the next until, you know, this is February 29th. And then often we get babies born on the 29th who, you know, you can be what, like 40 years old and be like, oh, I'm only 11 this year. You know, like it's, uh, I don't know. It's just like a interesting form of time travel that of course it's not actually, but you know, we're moving time around and I just think there's something to play with there magically. And then the other idea I had was just, you know, leap frogs, sleep frogs, they're hmm. amphibians. And so they, you know, they go between and leap days feel sort of liminal to me anyway, because again, we're, we're borrowing these minutes from days. And like I said, just keeping them in our back pocket and then being like, okay, we have enough now. Let's, <laughs> let's do the, the leap day. Here, here's all these minutes we saved up. I, I don't know. It's just, it's a really strange thing that we do to keep our calendar correct with the the seasons and the moon moon and the sun and every, I don't know. I just, I love it. <laughs> yeah, no, I love that. Yeah. And I think that that, that works. It's in, in like the, the point that you made about that sort of like assembling the day out of the sort of the scraps of other years and things like that. I think that's really fascinating. It makes me think, and this is kind of where we get leap day from to sort of a very extended extent. Do you know the Egyptian story of like the five extra days? No. So there's an Egyptian story that there was a, a god, uh, maybe Ra, it wasn't Ra, but I think it was one of Ra's kids who it was the, it was the father of Newt. And, and so he got mad because Newt fell in love with somebody that he didn't want her to be with and basically said that, well, okay, if you're going to marry this guy, then you can't, you can't, you'll never have children for all the, that there will be no days in the year when you can give children. And so then Toth gambled with time, like had a, had a wager with time and like played a game. Like it's like, a, it's like a gambling game with time itself and won five extra days and then inserted okay. those in the calendar. And so those are the days that Newt could actually give birth. And so she winds up giving birth to all the Egyptian gods during those days. And so this idea of like, you steal time, you steal pieces of time. Like it's, it's, it's this like, kind of extraordinarily lucky little bit of time that's been stolen from other calendars that you can do stuff with. So I think that's really yeah. interesting. Yeah, it does feel lucky. Yeah, which is funny because so, okay, so I did some folklore digging um, and it depend, It kind of depends on your culture. There's a lot of different places where being born on a leap is lucky. Uh, it's considered mm-hmm. to be a lucky thing. There are a few instances where you'll find kind of the counterpoint and people say like, no, it's actually really unlucky to be born on that day. And the reasoning there is that you're sort of unnaturally because you're not going to gain years the same way that other people will because you, your birthday always passes you by except for once every four years. So exactly. Yeah. But I still I can, thought it was interesting. So I can almost see someone being born on a leap day being kind of in the same vein as being, you know, treated as like a kid born with a call, for example. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just in that same sort of. Maybe not like a second sight, like is said with the call, but just, you know, between things a little bit. For sure. Yeah. 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 There's also a little bit of uh, romantic folklore with this. So one of the big traditions with this is that because February is a day out of time, it's also the day where at least in English and Irish tradition, women could propose to men. (laughs) Mm, Okay. Um, So like a Sadie Hawkins on steroids. Yeah. yeah, Like it's a super Sadie Hawkins kind of thing. And in Scotland, you were supposed to wear red if you were going to do that. So like if a woman showed up on February 20th wearing red, (laughs) you knew, you knew what was up. (laughs) You were like, Oh no. Or, Oh yes. You know, depending on your position. Right. (laughs) But there were, there's certain places where this, because this tradition was pretty widely spread throughout different parts of Europe in certain, certain forms of this. If if a woman proposed to a man and he refused or rejected, she was entitled to compensation in a lot of cases. <laughs> so wow. she could like, so she could get like money or she could demand a new dress in, in Denmark. At least at one point in time, she was to be given 12 new pairs of gloves. <laughs> so, Question. Yeah. So, so does it have to be done in good faith? So could I propose to you? Right. Knowing you'll turn me down and knowing I'm already married and it would be illegal. Just so you can get a new dress. Just so you get a new dress? Like, would that be a thing? I have no idea, but the way your devious mind works, I'm <laughs> away from you. I need a dress. Find <laughs> 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 something pretty. <laughs> 
Money, please. <laughs> Money, please. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay, yeah. All right. so I thought that was really interesting. That um, is. And then I found just a couple of, so there's another little bit of romantic lore, which says that if you can count a hundred white horses on February 29th, the first person you shake hands with afterwards will be the person you're going to marry. Okay. So that's, I, I don't know where that comes from. Well, I, mean, I know where it comes from in the folklore. It came from, came from Maryland. Yeah. <laughs> it's the place where this particular thing came from. But, but it, I, it, it's just one of those things where I have no idea how that actually shows up. There are a lot of like counting and then you get the thing rituals mm-hmm. where like you can count different things and then something will happen. But that was specific one with leap year was such an odd one that I had to include it. So yes. But I yeah. wonder if it's anything to do with the, like the counting up of the minutes. It's, you know, like you count mm. a bunch of things that day. And as the, yeah. the minutes kind of gather up to a, a full day, what you're counting gathers up to a full thing that you're, you know, that you're looking for. Right. It's, 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 it's like you're buffering, <laughs> you're, you're, you're buffering your romance the whole day. And finally you get a hundred percent. You get the little magical AOL. Well, it's done. <laughs> you You ever say that commercial with the, the kids <laughs> were in the play and it said, the only thing we have to fear is buffering. <laughs> I have not buffering. seen that. <laughs> It's like if, if computer problems were in real world problems. Mm, no, I have not seen that. That's really funny. Okay. About. Anyway. So, yes. Yeah. So, but yeah. So those are some leap day traditions that might be fun, might be interesting to, to I don't know how you want to incorporate them. I, I, I figure wear a little red on the 29th and just... Make everybody a little bit more nervous, for <laughs> sure. And then, I don't know, maybe you could turn this into something where, like, you ask for gifts, right? It would be such a neat tradition to have a, a day when, like, it's just a day when you go and get gifts for friends or something like that, right? Yeah, that like, could be fun. Yeah. So, every, you know, every four years, you just have a friend's day and you just go and buy gifts for your friends Aww. based on that. So That would be cool. nice. Yeah. So, yeah. So, that's that's what we found. That's um, our ideas. That's what we got for right now. But if other people have ideas, we'd love to hear them. So if anyone else knows folklore about Leap Day, please send it our way. We'd love to hear that. Mm-hmm. You can do that at compassandkey at gmail.com or New World Witchery Podcast at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. Our website is newworldwitchery.com where you can leave a comment and listen to episodes all, all the way back. <laughs> yep. We got a lot of them. All the way back to 20 aught 10. <laughs> 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 Which we're laughing about that. That is almost a decade and a half ago. So it's that's no, it's that's not. <laughs> yeah, it's, nope. Yep. Nope. Sure it's. Nope. It's not. Yeah. Next year our par- our our podcast gets a learner's permit. So oh my gosh, <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Is it's it? Amazing. Is it though? It is. <sighs> Oh my gosh. So yeah. So, so yeah, oh, lots of those. If you want to find out what's going on in our, our world, find us on social media, stuff like that. You can go to newworldwitchery.com slash find hyphen us. And that will tell you everything that uh, is going on and find all the different places we are. So, mm-hmm. and as we state at the top of the show, there's patreon.com, which you can, you know, come over and see which dollar amount you might want to give. And we have a lot of cool perks that is very worth it in my opinion and uh, yeah we're about to send out our <laughs> a little bit late but that's okay that's our fault <laughs> yeah. mostly on because of you know things um, but it, both of us it's we had a really wild year last year so it has been a year Let's but we're just, gonna be sending out some yeah. really nice patreon perks we're which excited. you can't get in on because we, we we based it all on like who was who was there at the beginning of this year but you can get in on them for future years for like our top tier Patreon perks. And then we have some other stuff that's going to be going out to the different levels. Uh, yeah. Well. We already have good ideas for the next one too. So yeah. So yeah. We're yeah. Really fun, so yeah. So yeah. And if you want to support us, Lane is also open to pretty dresses. So <laughs> you can send us yes. pretty dresses. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think that'll about do is for us. Uh, Lane, happy leap year. Happy leap day coming up. Wonderful, fun talking to you again. Yeah. And I'm glad that our, our friendship has been a magical slow burn too. So me too, for real. Like I, I know we joke, but me too. I it's just, been pretty great. It has been pretty, great. I'm pretty thrilled with it. I'm so lucky to still have you as a friend. Like what? Almost same. 15 years later. Yes, same. This year, this past year, honestly, has really, really driven that point home too. For sure. For sure. Yeah. But yeah. All right. Well, everybody, thanks for listening. Be well. 
New World Witchery is a production of New World Witchery Podcasts and is released under Creative Commons Share and Share Alike license. The title and closing music for this episode is Woman Blues by Paul Avgirnos, licensed from AudioSocket.